Hello, um, everyone. Um, very good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Good evening. Uh, we are very happy to um, host this event today. Um, and my name is Zenekstina Santos, and I coordinate the PhD <laughs> program Human Rights and Contemporary Societies together with my colleague uh, Bruno Sena Martins. Um, this PhD program um, will be uh, starting its fifth edition already, so receiving new students, new candidates, starting September this year. Uh, the first call for applications closes today, but if you know anyone or if yourself are planning to apply for a PhD, um, be um, aware that the second call for applications will open on the 1st of June. So that's a date to look forward to as well. Um, today's event is part of an online seminar series, uh, which we're very, very proud and, and happy to be um, organizing this year. And to tell you a little bit about the seminar series, uh, Bruno, uh, it's your turn. Okay, thank you, Anextina. So uh, it's, it's an honor to have Dr. Vandana Shiva with us. I want to greet everyone in, in the audience. And this is an event that is part of the online seminar series, Human Rights in Contemporary Societies. This is the second event. It started uh, on the 26th of April. We, and it will continue. The upcoming event, events are on the 12th of May with Robert McCrure. Uh, we'll have on the 26th of May, Shalini Renderia, and we'll have on the 2nd of June, Sue Scott, and also Raul Rao on the 16th of June. I'll leave the link for the full programs for the ones that want to, to follow up the events, and I'll also leave the link to the um, Human Rights in Contemporary Societies applications site, where prospective students can uh, apply to, to our doctoral program, okay? And now, Anikstina. Yes, so today's seminar will run as following. There will be a presentation by Dr. Shiva, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, she's um, an Indian scholar, an environmental activist, eco-feminist, and anti-globalization author. Let me uh, remind us um, here, for some of you, you will be reminded, others will learn that Dr. Shiva was also um, a researcher in a research project, an international research project that happened in SESH in 1999. Between 1999 and 2001, the project was called Reinventing Social Emancipation and it gathered researchers across the globe. Uh, so, Today's event is a way uh, of continuing a relationship that um, comes from, from, from a, a past uh, that, that thrills us, uh, really. Um, Dr. Shiva, she's based in Delhi, uh, has written more than 20 books. She's one of the leaders and board members of the International Forum on Globalization and the figure of the anti-globalization movement. She founded the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Natural Resource Policy, an organization devoted to developing sustainable methods of agriculture in 1982. In 1993, she received the Right Livelihood Award regarded as an alternative uh, Nobel Prize. Today, she's uh, giving a talk on Earth Democracy Apologies for that. I hope uh, you were able to hear most of the presentation and without taking any more room, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Raul. And there are ghosts in the machine. They do all kinds of things you don't want them to do. And people think, oh, precise, digital, down to the pixel more ghosts in these machines than in the industrial machines or in all the generations since then. Uh, you know, my own background is in quantum theory and uh, you know, issues of ecology, of issues of human rights were not really my first preoccupation. My first preoccupation, I had a passion for the psi function, yeah? the quantum function. 
and its mysteries. And that's what I spend the, my formal training on, my PhD on. But I suddenly noticed that we were starting to have a scarcity of water. We were starting to have scarcity of food. We started to have conflicts in the most prosperous areas like Punjab, the land of the five rivers, where, uh, you know, which is the really the breadbasket of India. And this is where the chemical revolution, the green revolution was first introduced. And so I started to dig deep into what was causing these conflicts. What was making the women rise to protect the forests in my region? Coming out and saying, we're gonna hug the trees. And over my last now five decade journey of understanding the connections between human rights and the rights of the earth, but also the deep connection between violence against the earth and violation of human rights. Take our present moment. I would never in my imagination have imagined that in the year 2021, oxygen would be the most biggest violation of human rights, having oxygen to breathe. And why has this happened? You might have been seeing on, on the news, on channels, people rushing for oxygen cylinders. But what was most touching is, you know, I talked about Punjab, but Punjab is the land where the Sikh religion was created, where Guru Nana gave the most amazing teachings. And one of his most important teaching was Life is about service, life is about a gift. So every Gurdwara, every Sikh temple gives food, free food to anyone who comes by. And this happens in the war in Syria, it happens during COVID in New York, it happens in earthquakes, wherever they've taken place. And it's happening in the oxygen crisis where they have said, okay, if people are lacking oxygen, we are going to create an oxygen langar. Langar is the gift of food, the giving and sharing of food. So here is a community sharing oxygen at a time where the human right to breathe is being violated. And if you just think of the year 2020, beginning with COVID, but also the Black Lives Matter, triggered by George Floyd's statement, I can't breathe. that denial of oxygen could become the very material basis of the violation of humans being alive. And this is so deeply connected to the movement I first got involved in. The Chipko movement that I mentioned was started by women in my region in the High Himalaya. And at that time, you know, the British colonial forestry used to treat forests as a timber mine, as the global economy still treats the world, everything is a mine. Mine for something or the other, mine for lithium, oxide, a mine for iron, or our bodies and our brains are mine for data. Everything is a mine to be extracted and mined. And the timber mining was leading to deforestation in the high uh, mountains. Um, you know, India received very heavy rainfall in the monsoon season. And with these very fragile youngest mountains, as this rain would fall and the naked mountains could not hold the rain, uh, we had landslides, the women were walking further with water, there was scarcity of food and fodder and fuel. And women on a certain day when a logging operation was happening after a disaster, 1970. Same place where a disaster took place now in February induced by a combination of climate change and maldevelopment. In this disaster, 2000 died. In past disasters, 20,000 in 2013, 30,000 in the Urusa super cyclone. Uh, this whole oxygen deprivation 
is what gets expressed at a planetary level as climate change. In the biosphere level with deforestation, destruction of biodiversity. And because it's all based on sucking out 600 million years of dead carbon from under the soil and burning it and thinking we have developed, it also at the lower levels is building up air pollution. Seven million people are dying because of air pollution annually. So if you just take the deprivation of oxygen, killing of the forest, the trees, the amazing green leaf that has this mechanism of taking the sunshine, taking the carbon dioxide and giving us oxygen to breathe. And in all the climate data, the green leaf is still missing. We want to make ever bigger solar plants. Today I was with colleagues in the Northeast of India on a press conference a solar land grab where indigenous people are being removed from their rice fields to grow a giant size solar power plant. So people who think, oh, renewable energy, wonderful, you know, that it also leads to violations. If we do not do it in a decentralized way within the ecological limits of ecosystems. In my lifetime, I have seen the denial of the right to water grow in my country. I've grown up in, in India, in, in the mountains where there were springs everywhere. And you could bend and drink from any spring. You could stop at every river and drink clean water. The assumption that waters have to be polluted only came with industrialism and globalization. And I have seen our rivers die in my lifetime. But with it, People are dying because polluted water leads to a human right denial to the right to water. 829,000 per year, which is nearly a million people die for lack of clean drinking water. And hunger, you know, it, it has ended up becoming my preoccupation over the last 36 years because I have witnessed so much of the violence against the earth, the violence against our farmers, sickness and disease on the planet. And I will come a little bit to you on how the food system that we have developed begins in war and ends in war and multiple forms of war. But every day, 25,000 people are dying of hunger. That's a human rights violation. A billion people are permanently hungry. Every 10 seconds a child is dying of hunger and malnutrition, 3.1 million children a year. And according to the UN, because of COVID, hunger will kill more people than the COVID itself. They're talking about a biblical famine. If everyone is locked down, people have lost their livelihoods. And for many, the livelihood had become earning your living. 250, 320 million is what the UN is estimating. We will be pushed to starvation. How did we get here? Let me first begin with the worldview, the paradigm that brought us here, and then talk a little bit how every one of these crises and violations of human rights is connected to violation of rights of the earth, ecosystems of the earth, integrity of species, integrity of biodiversity, and the integrity of the climate system of the world. The seeds of these multiple emergencies that we face that are becoming life-threatening were sown about 500 years ago with colonialism that was a very big metabolic rupture between human beings and the earth, with it a denial of the life and life generating capacities of the earth, but also an illusion of separation and the illusion that humans are superior, but every construct that made humans superior to nature also created superiority for the few humans who were defining 
this worldview. I mean, it was a handful of them. The East India a Company was created by 300 merchant adventurers. The textbooks we are taught in university that reshaped this worldview hundreds of years after they were written as if they are the Bibles of human futures were all written by a handful of men who had money interests, who were involved in the East India Company, uh, the commerce and framing the mental framework were all part of the same thing. So I have called colonialism, the transformation of a living earth, who's our mother, who meets our needs if we take care of her, which is all, what all indigenous cultures still practice. And they haven't given up. Today, while the Amazon is burning, the indigenous people are fighting for the life of the Amazon. Today, while our Himalaya snows are melting, our people are fighting for the rights of the mountains and the rights of the snows. So this transformation of Terra Madre to Terra Nullius then starts to lay the foundation of destroying the very sources that provide for the human needs and the human rights to breath and water and fruit and nutrition and health. Apartheid is the Afrikaans word for separation and apartness. It was constructed with colonization. The white colonizers went, took the land of the blacks. In the initial period to Indians as indentured labor, because the indentured labor was there, a lot of Indian traders went. Then they passed a law, Indian Act, to make it illegal for Indians to work. And in 1942, the Apartheid Act, which basically declared not only are blacks and whites totally separate, but they are, the whites are superior. And this same attitude is applied to nature as to human beings. All other species, but the non-white people, the indigenous people, the colored people, the women, farmers, peasants, workers, all become like nature to be colonized. The humanity is taken away from them. And to me, colonialism is a human rights violation. And it hasn't ended. Otherwise, why would we have Black Lives Matter today as the widest biggest movement in the United States? And then the idea of anthropocentrism, that some privileged human beings are smarter, superior, the workings of nature. Now, uh, or as a physicist originally, and now as an ecologist for 50 years of my life, I smile at that arrogance. I smile at the fact that a few people who worked for Hitler through IG Farben created chemicals to kill people. Pesticides were developed from those chemicals like Xylon B. Explosive factories became fertilizer factories. And these, this poison cartel, I call it, is the single biggest reason for killing on the planet right now. Other life, the reason insects are disappearing, bees are disappearing, butterflies are disappearing. But every year, 200,000 people are dying of pesticide poisoning. And in India, we have lost 400,000 farmers to suicide because of debt for chemicals and seeds. These are debt-driven suicides, all driven by the poison cartel. Now here's a group of people whose only skill is how to kill and how to make chemicals to kill. Then take over the very production of food and take over our minds to think of what the food and agriculture economy is like and what it should be, what the science is. Now, it just so happens, I had studied in Punjab. I'd done my MSc honors in Punjab in physics, particle physics. And a decade later, Punjab was erupting in violence. And I was working then for the United Nations University on a major global program on conflicts over resources. And I said, there are conflicts here and I'd like to understand the roots. And uh, they gave me permission. I wrote a book called The Violence of the Green Revolution. And, uh, and since that time, I have been addressing the myths 
that were created by the poison cartel about how without their poisons, the world can't be fed. 84, the peasants rose. Today, for more than four and a half months, the Indian peasants have risen again. If they were doing so well, why would they be protesting? Why would they allow themselves to be shot? 30,000 people were killed in Punjab in 1984. That's what made me write my book. But look at the other human rights violation related to the system. The farmers have their rights denied, but more importantly than that, the eaters have their rights denied. Never ever before a globalized industrial system was put in place did we have permanent structural hunger. We had localized famine, localized hunger because of a drought, a war, but then it would pass and people would grow their food again. Now people are growing food, but they're starving. Half of the people who don't have food today, you know, of the billion, 500 million are people who are growing crops. And why are they eating it? Either because the crop is inedible or because it's being grown at such high cost that they have to sell it to pay the debts. Also because a commodity system does not allow a farmer to retain anything. The farmer is in a total debt trap forever. I have called it corporate feudalism in today's time. The methods are more sophisticated, a lot of mediation by technology, a lot of mediation by um, uh, money. Yeah. You know, if you think of it, uh, the first civilizing mission was based on religion. You don't have our religion. And therefore, you're uncivilized, and we will civilize you. And if we have to kill you to civilize you, we we'll kill you. We will wipe out 90% of the indigenous people of the Americas. How many of the Aboriginal people? And we were all turned into Bushmen. Yeah. Literature is now showing that the Australian Aboriginal people were farming long before any other part of the world. 60,000 years ago. Humans have only been around a short 200,000 on this lovely planet, which has evolved over 4 billion years. Only 200,000. And of that 60,000 years, Aboriginal people of Australia were farming and farmed so beautifully that they left no trace of damage. And because they left no trace of damage, they were called primitive. If you look at the literature on Terra Nullius, the jurisprudence on Terra Nullius, they leave no footprint. But that is sophistication to live on this world. Yeah. To leave no ecological footprint is not primitiveness, it is evolution. My own country has farmed for 10,000 years. Our farming has been messed up first by colonialism, which forced us to grow plantation crop. And now with the green revolution, now with the second green revolution, and now with the digital revolution, it's like greed knows no limits. And that is the true COVID of the world. It is the true virus. Not knowing limits, not respecting the integrity of the other, the human rights of the other, 50% of the greenhouse gases come from this industrial globalized systems. I have a book called Soil Not Oil, which goes into the details of this. 75% of the destruction of soil and water is because of this form of farming. And because of the chemicals in the system and the fact that it produces nutritionally empty crops, what we have is first malnutrition, then chronic diseases, and then the COVID. This limitless greed system of agribusiness, which is not a food system, I would not call it a food system because food nourishes us. Food nourishes the earth. Food is the currency of life. Food is what circulates as nutrition, species to species to species, soil to the plants, to our bodies, back to the soil. That amazing currency of life is what makes life. The commodities that are being grown are destroying 
ecosystems. They are threatening our health. It is now so very clear that in, in the last 30 years of globalized agriculture, agribusiness has invaded into every forest into which they can to turn them into commodity producing system. Palm oil in the Indonesian rainforest, palm oil in the Congo, soya bean in the Amazon. And as you invade into the forests, the, the viruses which were on animals escape and spill over and now become deadly diseases. 300 new epidemics have been created in the last 30 years of which COVID is the latest. But we've had the Ebola's, we've had the Zika's, we've had the um, Nile virus, we've had SARS, we've had H1N1. We've had wave after wave. And the data is also clear. I've done a reflections on the coronavirus and the reflections on the coronavirus shows that you have chronic diseases because of bad food and you get the infection, your risks of dying increase 9.2% if you have diabetes and 7.6% if you have cancer. These are human rights violations. It is time to stop putting them into these Cartesian boxes of separation where every step of a crisis is addressed by creating yet another crisis and creating an opportunity. I have watched this in my lifetime. You know, we became independent as, an, as a country. We had our plans on how to be self-reliant and sovereign. And then the World Bank and IMF were created to recolonize all of the South. And they got us into debt. And in 91, it's the debt that led to the total changes in how agriculture is done. The protests of Indian farmers today are against those reforms. And I don't know why they're called reforms. They should just be called recolonization. Each phase should be called recolonization. The latest phase of this recolonization is a new merger of the new colonizers. I've written about it in my book, Oneness Versus One Percent. I wrote this book because I was totally shocked to watch Bill Gates stand on the stage with the heads of state in Paris at the climate summit. And I said, since when did billionaires become equal to elected heads of state? Since when did democracy get trumped by money? And I wrote that book to solve this puzzle. How did these billionaires become so rich? How did they got so much power? And what are their plans for the future? And everything I wrote then in that book has just got accelerated fast forward. We've done a report called Gates to a Global Empire to follow up more recently what's happening. And another report on fake solutions to climate change. But let me just show you the new convergence of powers that are taking decision-making beyond democracy, which is the place where human rights protection takes place. We have the convergence of big technology, big ag and the poison cartel, big finance, you know, suddenly they call, you know, it used to be money, which used to be exchanged, then they called it capital, then they called it finance, and now they call it FinTech, yeah? because all, it's all about digital. The four have converged to control the food system. So how do they control the food system? My life has been dedicated to defending the rights of farmers to save seeds, the human right of farmers to save seed, the right of the seed to be seed, to not be pushed to extinction. I've done this now for 34 years, 35 years. Today, the seeds are now being appropriated by big technology giants like Biggs, which means the farmer's rights will be further eroded. Worse, we created laws to protect the rights of farmers. We created laws in the Convention on Biological Diversity. We created laws in the FAO called the Seed Treaty. Now, if I come into your country and take seed, there's laws to say you have to take permission. But if I've already stolen your seeds and I put them into my collections, and then I do a 
digital genomic mapping. Just a genomic mapping. I have no idea what the seed is. The computer does it for me. I've never bred a seed. I don't know what the seed is. I don't know what it produces. Stolen seed, that data tells me this is a drought resistant corn. I run hundreds and thousands of drought resistant corns through computers and then do guesswork and take a pageant. On the genome, it's like the colonial maps. They sat in Europe and made lines across our continents. The two dimensional map on paper is today the digital map in computers. Then it was about territory. Today it is about the territory within living, every living system. Farming without farmers, what could be a more violent human right violation than imagining that most of humanity with farms. Most of humanity still farmed for a livelihood. They should be made to disappear with no consent. And this at a time where all research and my research has shown small farms produce more, ecological farms produce more, biodiversity produces more. All the evidence is showing we need the small farmers to feed the world. I have a book called Who Really Feeds the World that has a lot of data in it. I was, it was written for the expo. Uh, we are in a moment where humanity itself is being rendered disposable. I always say, during the first colonialism, Africans were captured and taken as slaves to the Americas. Today, the slave is not needed. The slave is substitutable with artificial intelligence and robotics. And if you listen to the language of the big tech giants, the Zuckerbergs, the Silicon Valley people, the Googles, they, they use constantly two phrases, that human beings can't be allowed to be human because they're inadequate. So how, how we were treated as people of color is how all humans are being treated today by big tech. And if human rights are about the right to be human and the right to be alive, then the denial of our humanity is a foundational violation of human rights. And I would encourage those of you who are entering the PhD program or doing your PhD to investigate these matters deeply. Just give you two examples. Uh, at the peak of the corona, a patent was issued to Microsoft. It's called World Patents 060606. Humans are reduced to a user, users of machines. The machines tap their data, either through computers or through smartwares, our brain and body activity. This is then processed through algorithms. And the algorithms assign a value to us. Just like slaves were assigned values, according to how much they would be able to work. Human beings will be assigned values by artificial intelligence and algorithms, crypto values. Our humanity will be decided by a digitally constructed currency. This is a watershed for humanity and human rights and all human rights scholars need to look at this deeply. But I also talked about food as a human right. And what my work now has taught me is the amazing systems that have been created, that there's trillions of organisms in the soil. And the more biodiversity we grow in our fields, the more nutrition we grow, we said we won't measure yield per acre. That doesn't tell you anything. We will measure nutrition per acre. But then the food we eat isn't just fuel that's going through a digestive tract. Our digestive system, the gut microbiome is one of the richest ecosystems. It's a neural ecosystem. It is being called the second brain, a hundred trillion microbes, which form 90% of us are working away. And when we poison their habitat or deprive them of nourishment, our entire body gets deprived. We get neurodegenerative degenerative diseases, we get cancer, we get diabetes, we get obesity, we get uh, infertility, we get endocrine disruption, all the chronic diseases, assault on the gut microbiome. So I really feel we are 
at this threshold where A, what is being human needs to be reflected on again in very serious terms. And B, what does the right to be human entail in terms of the institutions and paradigms we must create? My preoccupation since 1999, when we stopped the logic of free trade, that corporations have the first right to make money and the planet has no rights and human beings have no rights, we stopped WTO in Seattle. And that's when I articulated the earth democracy paradigm. For me, earth democracy as a worldview and paradigm I practice is based on the recognition that the earth is living. And it's on the earth we depend on our foundational human rights to breathe, human rights to drink water, the human right to have food and to have health. We are all members of one earth family. We are related, we are not separate. eco apartheid is a construct. We are part of the earth, we are not her masters. And we are interconnected through the living currencies of breath, water and nourishment. You know, Indian civilization that way is so sophisticated. When you think of the deep breathing, the pranayam, foundational to health. I have a lot of friends who are yoga teachers. They said nothing as miraculous as pranayam. Prana, the breath of life. I am the pathway for the breath of life. You've got to clear the pathway. The pathways are blocked. And of water and food and nourishment, and because the earth has rights, she has absolute rights anyway. But in addition, when we protect her rights, when we protect her streams, when we protect her forests, when I protect her seeds, we actually get more food. Yeah, our rights flow like a spring from our relationship with the earth, the loving relationship with the earth, the duty to protect her. We are part of one humanity on one planet. And this to me is where the hum human rights in the contemporary times deepens. All humans are equal, we've known that. Our diversity enriches life and cannot be made the justification for inequality and injustice, including the new apartheids that are being created by people not having money to buy these gadgets. I know that since the COVID lockdown and schools were put online, we have had made progress, 100% literacy, even in states like Kerala, 100% literacy, every child goes to school. But these are free public schools. The smartphone, Apple will never sell you a free smartphone or even a lower cost smartphone. I have read at least six cases of young girls passionate about their studies. Parents, daily wage workers could not buy the phone the child had to drop out of education. They committed suicide. This is a violation of human rights. I think the contemporary lockdown needs to be investigated from the lockdown, from the prism of human rights. Future generations have a right to enjoy their rights. And I'm very happy to know that today, a German court has filed a ruling that not protecting the climate for future generations is a violation of the rights of future generations. Um, and then as I articulated my book, Earth Democracy, and since then my experience day to day with growing food, saving seed, creating local economies has shown me that Earth Democracy is based on not economies of greed that kill and extract, but living economies that nourish and give and create solidarity. Living democracies that are true, not the dead democracy where corporations have hijacked elections everywhere, big money decides who will be a head of state. Living democracies are sharing in the life of the earth and participating in decisions for the common good and living cultures because our cultures themselves since colonialism our cultures were eroded. We were told we aren't cultured. We have to be civilized. And thank goodness we refuse to be civilized in that uncivilized way. Because to the, today the remnants of indigenous thinking, of indigenous practices 
is what is showing the path to the future of humanity, the path to the rights of the earth and the rights of human beings. At this point, we cannot afford to allow closure of human rights or of the future because the closure of human rights will be a closure of the future. We are standing on the precipice, looking at collapse, looking at possible extinction and every step that deprives us of our humanity and our earthiness will be a further step towards collapse, even though the tech billionaires think, A, we can be turned into machines and live forever. I'm on money being invested in cryogenics to keep dead bodies frozen so that in future when you can reconstitute the body and heads, billionaires are cutting off their heads because they think the brain is here. They don't realize in the, the, it's in the gut and it's in the living gut. And the brain is not an organ. The intelligence is a thinking process distributed throughout nature, our relationship, community, our entire body. And then of course we have brilliant guys like the Elon Musks and the, the Amazon fellows who think we can destroy this planet and we'll escape to Mars. Mars is a dead planet. This earth is a home. Taking care of our home is the way to defend human rights. Thank you.